Hey everybody, in this video we are going to be talking about different ways that we can create value with ink. So to get started we first need to understand that there's a lot of different methods of application that we can use with ink. So for this video I'm going to be using some micron pens. Now something about micron pens is they are a fixed width pen. So they only stay the same width. They don't change with pressure or anything. And we can tell the size of the pen by the number on them. For example, I have 005, which is super tiny, all the way up to 03 or 05. Um, so 05 is going to be a lot bigger than 005. So just depending on the intensity of the mark you want to make, you're going to use a smaller or bigger pen. Um, I also have some brush pens. Um, these are from Tombow, but there's lots of different brands. So the brush pen is going to change the thickness of the line depending on the pressure that you put on it. So this one is going to be a finer tip that doesn't vary as much in terms of pressure. And then this one is a larger tip that is going to vary a lot with the pressure that I put on it. And then lastly, I have a white gel pen. Um, you can use white acrylic ink with a dip pen or a brush as well. Um, unfortunately, I'm stuck in my house right now, so I do not have access to my liquid ink and pen nibs and all that good stuff. So we're working with what we have. Um, what we're going to do to get started is first just talk about some different textures or techniques that we can use with the ink and practice a quick little value scale with each of them. So the first one that we're going to work with is hatching. So hatching is um, just using kind of parallel lines to create value. So when we're working with hatching, um, to create a darker value, we're going to keep our lines really close together. So I'm just going to start by making my lines as close as I can together. Another thing to keep in mind, especially if you're using a fixed width pen, is the thickness of the line is going to affect your value as well. So for example, right now I'm using my thickest pen. So that is going to give me the implication of a darker value just naturally. Now as I move up, I might switch to using a thinner pen and that might help make it appear a little more light in terms of value. You may also notice that I am working on toned paper. So why I'm doing that is because I think it's really fun when I'm working with ink to be able to use white ink as well. So my toned paper kind of becomes my middle value and then I can create lighter highlights with the white ink. So as you'll see, as I'm moving upwards, my lines are getting slightly further and further apart. This is going to give you the impression that your values are getting lighter. I'm going to switch to a slightly thinner micron pen as well. Another thing to note about micron pens is they tend to work better when you are holding them more upright. If you're holding them at an angle, you're not really getting a lot of the felt part touching your paper so it gets kind of scratchy and doesn't work out very well. So holding them closer to upright is going to give you a nicer line and it's just going to be a little bit easier to work with. So now I've switched to one of my smallest pens and my lines are getting really far apart. So what I think I might do now is take my white gel pen and we're just going to switch gears and I'm going to slowly start pulling my white lines closer and closer together to create highlights. All right, so now we have a nice little value scale made out of just hatching. So hatching, again, those parallel lines. The next technique we're going to look at is cross hatching. So basically it's a similar technique. We're just crossing over our marks by going the opposite direction. So once we have our hatched marks, we're just going to go across our image. So your cross hatching marks could go diagonal, they could go up and down. Um, if we're creating a really dark value, 
I could go in and even add more marks going across to really darken things up. And then of course, as we get lighter, we're going to pull our lines just slightly further apart. So we're just using less lines to create our values. And then we'll begin the same process again with our white gel pen. This could also lead into a more specialized type of cross hatching called cross contour. So these lines are going to start curving around forms when we start creating them, and that's going to give it more of a sense of volume. We'll look at some examples of that in just a little bit. Our next technique that we're going to look at is called stippling. So stippling is maybe what you might know as pointillism. We're creating an image out of lots of little dots. This is a time-consuming technique, but I find it to be pretty meditative. So obviously the larger your dots and the closer together they are, the darker your values are going to be. I once did an 18 by 24 color pointillism artwork with crayons and I would work on it for just hours and hours at a time, just like little tiny sections at a time. And by the time I was done, all I could hear is this tapping and all I could see were dots whenever I would look away from it. So that was, that was really an experience for me. Um, definitely, you know, I learned a lot from it, but never want to do it again. <laughs> I think I'll keep my stippling to smaller pieces from here on out. So now that I have my value scale with my darks, then I can go ahead and move on to my lights. So obviously we're just making sure that the softer our value is or the closer to the middle range here, um, the further apart our marks are and the closer we get to our lightest or our darkest values, our marks are going to be a lot closer together. All right, so there we have an example of a stippled value scale. So the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of texture is the way that we can actually just use patterns to create textures. Um, this could be done in circles or squares or scribbles or crosses or like any sort of pattern that you want to repeat over and over again. Um, I'm just going to do scribbling as my example, but this can be done in many, many, many ways. So I'm going to move to using my brush pen. I think I'm going to start with my thicker brush pen. And basically I'm just going to scribble. So clearly the, the more your scribbles overlap and the closer those marks are together, the darker your value is going to be. And then the further apart they get, the lighter your values are going to be. I really enjoy using a brush pen when I do this, but I also enjoy using a dip pen because um, I feel like I can be really loose with it. And I think this is a really great exercise for people who are really tight and rigid in their drawing. So like they need to have like a lot of control over what they're doing. This is a great exercise in letting go. And honestly, it's really relaxing. I recommend it. It's, it's nice to work with. Um, it just feels different than I think if you are the type of person that really likes to be highly organized. I guess it is still kind of organized in a way. It's like organized chaos. So what we're going to do next is we are just going to practice applying these different techniques into a drawing. Um, but first, let's look at some examples. So here we see how Rembrandt is able to use a very loose gestural form of cross-hatching to create a quick self-portrait. In this detail of a drawing by Peter Paul Rubens, we're seeing a much more tightly controlled example of cross-hatching. Also notice how he's using line variation to establish the values as well. So those thinner, more delicate lines are going to be lighter values, whereas the thicker, more aggressive lines create darker values. This woodcut by Albrecht Dürer is a masterful example of the combination of hatching, cross-contour, and cross-hatching. 
notice how he's able to vary the lines to create darker values at the start of a line and lighter values at the end. Also note how the lines curve around the forms to help create a nice sense of volume. And our images have these intense cross-hatching to create these dark values within the shadows. If you ever need a quick reference for cross-hatching, look no further than your paper money. Um, here we're going to see a wide variety of hatching, cross-hatching, stippled lines. There's even like dots between the hatch marks to make it even darker. And all of these are using cross-contour marks to create volume. So I've sketched out just a couple pairs of eyes so that we can practice working with these different techniques. So I think what I'm going to do is start with hatching. I think what's really interesting about hatching is that it tends to look really, really flat. Like it's, it's hard to get a good semblance of volume with hatching. That's just something to be aware of. And maybe that's like an aesthetic choice that you make. So I'm going to start with just all vertical lines here and see how that ends up turning out. So you might notice I'm not like drawing outlines or anything. I'm really focusing on keeping all of my lines vertical and that's helping me kind of follow along the form. It's kind of a challenge because I think your brain wants to, you know, draw the curves of things. So working in this way is going to be a little challenging to break that habit. I think one cool thing you can do with hatching is break your lines up. So like they don't always have to be a long solid line and that's going to create a little bit of visual interest too. You could also play with tapering your lines and playing with that um, line variation. That's going to kind of help create some sense of volume in your work. So instead of drawing an outline, I'm actually just going over like the crease of the eyelid with another layer of vertical lines. And that is kind of helping create a sense of like a darker value. It's like almost an outline, not quite. Now that I've got my basic hatching in, I can go in with my white pen and add in some of the highlights that I'm seeing. All right, that feels pretty good to me. Let's move on to cross hatching. So I think with this cross hatching, I'm going to focus more on cross contour lines. So you can kind of see that technique that I was describing earlier. So what I want to do is I want my marks to kind of follow the curves of the form. So this could be a very tightly controlled technique or it could be very loose and kind of expressive. I think it's entirely dependent on, you know, your intent and your style. So I'm going to focus on kind of following the curves of my form and then I'm going to go across the form. So like we said, cross contour so I would need to figure out like this is maybe one of the main directions it's going. So if I were to go against that, I want to think about, you know, is it bulging outwards? Is it curving in? Is it more straight? Um, these are all thoughts that I want to have to like create that feeling of volume and form in the work. So this requires like a little bit more thought and planning to make sure that your marks are, you know, kind of going in the direction that you want it to, to create a sense of volume. And just like in those etchings and engravings we were looking at, we can break up the marks, give them kind of like a dotted feeling that's going to help kind of give it a little more texture and break up your line a little so it's not as intense. So now as I'm going across the form, I'm thinking about, you know, what direction is 
this body actually going in, in three dimensions, and I'm trying to kind of mimic that shape. So I'm trying to follow the curve of the brow bone. That's going to help it look more round. You know, here this part of the brow bone is a lot more curved, whereas this one is more of like a flat plane. So I think my lines might be more flat in this space. So you might note as I am working on the ball of the eye, the sclera, um, that my marks are like really curving around that form. That's going to help give the impression of roundness and give you kind of a sense of volume. And just like the last one, I'm trying not to overdo the white. I want to let those mid-tones shine through. And what's great with this technique with cross-hatching is it really works well with all the other techniques. You can kind of combine or you can like simplify down to hatching in certain areas and kind of play around with that. I think it's a versatile tool for sure. We're going to move on to stippling. So this one's going to take a while. Um, I think I'm going to use my larger brush pen just to go a little bit faster, but you could be like super uh, like intricate with this if you wanted and use a small um, and use a small pen if you wanted to. So like I said before, this is definitely the most time consuming of the techniques, especially as you're building up those darker values. But it definitely does yield some really interesting results. So it is something fun to play with. And if you just need to like zone out for a while, this is probably the technique for you. So just like when I was working with the hatching technique, I'm not drawing lines here. Like there are no lines in this artwork. It's just creating edges. And so the way that I create sort of the indication of an edge is I'm just like really concentrating my dots in that section. And that is going to kind of help keep everything uh, darker. And if I'm if I'm being very intentional about like the placement of those marks, it's going to give you almost a line. It's close to a line, um, and that's going to help create those details that you need to make it look relatively realistic. All right, so there's some stippling. Now for the Fast one, let's do some scribbling. Loosen up after that rigidity. I'm gonna have a cramp after that. <laughs> All right, scribble away. This technique is really fun with a dip pen because you can get some like nice splatters and other textures in there as you're doing it. I think the key is to not get too carried away too quickly because you might overdo it and lose your image. So as fun as it is, make sure you are thinking at least about your values and everything. Obviously, this is also a little bit easier to do when it's larger. All right, so there we have it. We've got four different ways of working with ink techniques. Hopefully, you can apply that into some of the work that you do. Thanks for watching and keep creating.